Hi everyone, welcome to our special Saki evening. We are thrilled to be able to do um, this different type of wine tasting. It's a Saki tasting and, you know, I don't know much about it. Um, I've learned a little bit. Some of you will have read uh, my basics guide blog, which I did to kind of help people choose which one, which one to buy. Um, hopefully, some of you have sake this evening and, you know, specifically the ones that Robin through Sarakami has sent out to you. And we'll be going through each of those um, and we'll be talking about the styles of sake so that you can, uh, you know, get a better understanding of what it is. So I'll just do the introductions. To, um, as usual, we have the wonderful Amelia with us, um, who Hello. is... In the process of booking like corporate events, Christmas parties, anything like that. So if you want something exciting but remote done, then <laughs> Amelia is your girl. We can we can sort that out. Um, we've got Ria Yoshitaki, who I've not met in person before, but I'm so honoured that you could join us uh, tonight. She is the UK ambassador of Saki. And we have Asami Tasaka as well. Again, really delighted to meet you this evening. Um, and uh, Asami is the MD of World Saki Imports. So, you know, these ladies know everything there is to know about Saki and also the English tastes. So how to integrate Saki into the UK. Then we also have Robin Sola, who's here to like representing Sorokami. So Robin sent out all of the sakis to those of you who ordered them. Thank you for those who did. Um, I've got I've got mine. You can't really see because I've got my background on, but I've got this one, which is the um, Koshino Kanbai, which I was told was the one for beginners. So I am definitely a sake beginner, um, but that makes this one this webinar even more interesting for me because I'm going to learn a huge deal and I'm probably going to be throwing quite a few questions at Rie and Asami as well as we go along, as well, Amelia. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're, you know, really, really interested to get to grips with what Saki is. Um, the ladies and Robin have put together like a little schedule to kind of introduce us and yeah, Amelia and I will be uh, your conduit of questions. Uh, for those of you who haven't been on our webinars before, there is a chat box which you can open up. That goes quite quickly. You can chat to each other, you can chat to us, you can make comments. There is also a Q&A box um, where if you have a specific question that you want answered, we will make sure that all of those questions in the Q&A box do get answered. Sometimes the chat box goes a bit quick. So um, yeah, let us know if you want those. Um, I'm going to keep it in the um, gallery view so that you can see all of us as we go through. Um, and I will hand over to Rie, who's going to talk us through uh, what Saki is. Well, um, before me, actually, I, um, we thought it would be nice to hear from the experience for Robin. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Um... My experience with sake, well, it really um, started as uh, quite a bad one, actually. Uh, so I grew up in France and, uh, well, most people drink wine there. Uh, sake is quite rare, especially back then. And I re just remember my dad sort of, you know, ordering the, the sake that was on the menu uh, at the restaurant. And uh, it was just like this very strong sort of licorice uh, thing and so I was quite scarred from that and I especially tried it when I was like probably too young to, to try that um, and so I had this very biased image of sake and it was only sadly until I moved to Japan and spent five years there that I've discovered what sake actually was and um, I was in uh, Izaka with my friend and they ordered sake and I was like well I know you know we're drinking at university here but I don't want to you know it's still early <laughs> and, and uh, but I've tried it and it was just this very, very diff different drink, and uh, it was just very elegant, smooth, drinkable, not strong, not a spirit, and uh, I was just mind blown from there, and so this is when really my curiosity uh, started for the drink, and um, then I got back here, and I've discovered that I've been missing sake this whole time here in London, and I wanted to help people have their sake epiphany, just like I had the chance to have 
in Japan, but not everyone, especially now, have the chance to go to Japan. So uh, that's how really Sorokami was born. Yeah. Very nice. I think that's really interesting because conversation I had with um, Robin early on was, you know, your your first experience of sake can win or lose you into the category, as, you know, especially as you know us in the UK, it's not everywhere, so you don't you don't just give it another go, or you know, you don't tend to have a friend saying, "Oh, try this again," like I did with gin. Um, but with sake, you don't really see it everywhere. You don't really know what it is you don't really know what you're buying and as I spoke to the media before um it kind of it must be what you know what people think about the wine world before they understand what wine is and the same with sake and you know Robin made the comment that the first time is so important so and if any of you having your first time trying sake tonight hopefully you'll enjoy it and hopefully we can win you over and I I also think people are very um, there's a lot of misconceptions uh, about sake. Lots of people assume that it's a spirit and therefore, you know, they either think, oh, you just down it or you drink it heated up. They don't actually appreciate the nuances and how to, how you can appreciate it with the Japanese, but also a whole range of different foods too. And I think it's, you know, so they don't really understand the context. They don't really know the process. They don't really know what to be looking out for. The, the flavors are completely different than however even if they'd gone to a wine course or whatever sometimes some of the exotic fruit flavors i was lucky enough to spend a month in japan with my father who's obsessed with japan and i was like oh my gosh and then suddenly there were certain herbs or certain fruits out there where i was like oh, yeah i can totally see how that works but then it's almost like translating those nuances to an english palette or a u.s palette or a you know i, I think um for me, it was like an amazing, like real sen uh, learning experience just to re-engage with the senses and how does one translate. And uh, for me, it was like exciting as well as overwhelming. And I'm still learning. And it's been a while since that trip to Japan. So I was really excited to re-engage with this. And having done our event together, Asami and Rie, mm. I think it was about five years ago in London. Yeah. Oh my God. Six, Six years. years. Six years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we haven't aged much though. No, I know. This is why I get full. <laughs> yeah, I know. You guys are the best advertisements. Why why everyone should be drinking sake. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the zoom screen thing. <laughs> shall okay, we? shall we start? Mm -hmm. Please. Yes. So we're going to to do the sharing of the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Ria Yoshitake, as um, uh, Soma kindly introduced. I've been doing um, uh, sake promotion over 10 years where I met Amelia as a friend. So this is like a reunion of <laughs> old friends. So I'm so excited. You haven't changed at all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, this is, I'm going to speak about five, ten minutes to concentrate on all the information by which you could be a sake expert, if not a sake brafa. So, you know, <laughs> um, sake is something, it's such in the depth because it's a culture, but it's um, try to be easy and um, make as easy as possible. So, what is sake? Everybody knows as a rice wine, but it's from our sort of Japanese point of view. Uh, it's a national drink, very unique national drink, which has a history of like a 2000 years. And in Japan, we call it Nihon Shu. Nihon means Japan, Shu, sake. So Nihon Shu is the word we use in Japan. But um, again, which has a long history, which are almost emotionally, um, you know, related for us. But we are not going to go through too much about that because sake is not only for Japan, but it's becoming international drink, as you know, especially in America where you are, Amelia. It's getting yeah. even I 10, 10 years ahead of us. Um, it's getting so. Ask you about that. I'm not going to interrupt the presentation, but I, I will definitely flag you up on that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is sake 
Um, I know that everybody is here and loves wine, but if the wine is created by the God, hands of God, then sake is created man. I'm going to emphasize this one because sake is something, it's a pure craftsmanship. You know, sake, wine is almost done when the sun is nice and the weather is good and the beautiful grape is done. But Sake is something out of grain, sake rice. You have to make something out of it. So you can imagine how much more work you have to do with sake. I don't want to go technical, but I just tell you a little bit about ingredients. Obviously, you know, sake is now made from rice, but the rice we have a special rice for sake. It's not only just the eating rice, but it's for the premium sake. We use a special rice, which has a bigger grain, which has more starch, which we need it, okay? Then water, can you imagine the, when you look at the bottle, 80% is just the water, okay? So how important that water can be but uh, water is not the same everywhere. Especially in Japan, we have a pure, softer water with a little, uh, much less minerals, such as iron, which is very bad for sake making. So nowadays they make sake overseas, which is fine, but they need to work and find the uh, water itself to make it. Then rice and water, now we have it, but we need to change, you know, to transformation. For that, we use something microorganism. This is very special about sake called koji. It's a fungus. We call it magical mold. This is the heart of sake making. <laughs> and uh, that's convert uh, rice grain to sugar. Then as wine does, sugar into alcohol then where the uh, yeast comes in. So in sake making, this is something you could remember the word because this is killer. Multiple parallel fermentation, <laughs> which means you put everything in the one tank and all the reaction happening and make sake. This is only for sake making. It's very unique on the earth. Beer is similar process, but they make one step by one step, but the sake all together, multiple parallel fermentation, that gives much depth in the taste and the complication and the finesse. So that's why it's such a beautiful drink is created. Um, look, when you know about the sake, everybody talks about the hake, uh, how sake is made because Depending on how you make sake, you can make a different kinds of styles. So it's in a way, it's like a cooking, depending on what you put, how you, you know, heat, low temperature, high temperature. But anyway, sake is, has a, such a long step. I'm not going through everyone, but um, this is how people, uh, sake makers takes time to, for, good sake like a three weeks they have to just keep working on it before they make a bottling and also there are two things so uh, one thing we don't uh, wine doesn't do it here is a pasteurization to you know heat sake to uh, stabilize the quality so that's something again unique so it's all about kind of tsukuri, we call it sake making. But here, for just now to drink, but um, living in UK for a long time and promoting sake, I always come across such a misconception about sake. Sake is not new in this country, but it has been wrong, uh, wrongly percepted which I want to go through with you because this is a kind of key to understand about sake. First, <laughs> alcohol. 
how come many people think sake is so strong? I mean, if you, I, I tried to serve sake for the people who do not know about sake. They say, oh, sake, too strong for me. I said, you drink wine, don't you? You drink with small grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. looks like a grappa like a or, you know, spirits. Uh, um, then sake is average 15%, 16%, which is slightly higher than the red, you know, French wine or things. So we it's wanted to California. say... <laughs> oh, yeah, California is so strong. <laughs> Except yeah. maybe there are wines uh, which is stronger than sake, who knows? Mm -hmm. So take it easy. Sake is not the spirit. Sake is just like a wine. Okay, that's the first step. Temperature. In the old cliche, many people still think, oh, sake has to be drunk warm. But this is a kind of old thing. But sake is another unique drink, which you can drink hot and cold, both. So if you buy one bottle, you can even start cold or chilled or even with the ice in it sometimes, then you can warm it up. So you can enjoy the different sensations. This is a really serious subject, food pairing, especially like uh, Robin, French people loves this subject, right? Absolutely. Everybody thinks sake only goes with sushi. Yes, of course it goes very well. But it is not true. Sake is the one which doesn't fight with food. I love this word said by the uh, you know, English master of Toji, uh, sake brew. Actually, because sake has uh, so much amino acid, which is umami actually, which complements the food, any kinds of food almost. So we can now uh, confidently say Sake beyond the sushi, it goes with curry, spaghetti, you know, even uh, <laughs> we were thinking cheese. eating ah, this one later. You made, cheese, you cheese made sake is incredible because uh, both fermented, we have uh, even the session to go with the cheese and the sake in the details. So please do not hesitate to try sake with a different food. Okay, promise? I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. And this is a variety of sake. I, when it comes, I really feel like uh, hiding my face because it's so, in a way, complicated. There are too many sake kinds. I always say, if we talk about Chateau Mago or Latou, there are big wine then second, third, or, you know, generic. Not that so many, and they always carry the same name. As I said, the sake is like a cooking. You can make so many different types by later um, rubbing, as Sami would explain, by polishing the rice, the classification changes, and also style, then vertically, horizontally, there are so many different uh, sake. This actually is very confusing, I'm sorry to say, but um, there are many kinds of sake. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is something Asami and Anna did. Yeah, in Instagram. Instagram, Instagram talked <laughs> about <laughs> one hour. Because <laughs> about the this beauty. is just amazing. If we are allowed, to say sake is good for health and beauty, which is quite difficult because alcohol. <laughs> you need it. You will sell sake like a hot cake, but it's actually in Japan, there are, we have a saying, sake is the best medicine, king of the medicines. And the ears, I mean, it's been used for many purposes and the heart and liver, if you drink sake every day, a glass, you can even live longer. That's been, you know, we've been told. And I think proven too. Yes. We live long. <laughs> we have so many people who live long. And beauty wise, 
this is a definitely everybody has to try tomorrow morning to touch your skin because of the again lots of amino acid in there it's moisturized your skin and they keep your skin youthful so this is really good there are lots of cosmetics made from uh, sake but um i don't want to go to the um, you know <laughs> prison <laughs> of saying something <laughs> uh, but it's uh, i personally believe some good amount moderate drinking is sometimes you know help help uh, oh, um, <laughs> can i just ask i remember six years ago um you said at the at my event that um it used to be a custom in Japan where brides to be on the evening before their wedding they would bathe in sake. Oh, that's some um, different purpose. I think the sake uh, is always used for cleansing the spirits or the uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mentioned that one taking bath. Yeah, but it's um before the wedding, bride is given the sake to drink by the parent. So that uh, it looks good and the moisturize the skin or something. Uh, like that. Ah, okay. That kind of things. But it's sake is kind of for us sacred uh, drink because originally it was made to appreciate uh, for the oh, god. Yeah. Then after that, we appreciate the life to share, so we drink together. So it's com uh, you know bringing everybody together. So through sake, this is definite thing is we can make more friends just than just drinking on, it, on your own. Okay, so this is a, just a simple introduction. Then I pass on to, um, okay, sorry, one more thing. This is another useful term to remember. Um, it is because it is becoming English now. Sake brewery. We call it the Kura. It's beautiful, uh, you know, buildings. These are called the Kura. It used to be the Stella warehouse. Then sake maker, actually the owner of this Kura is called the Kuramoto, but if we not necessarily make sake, he's just the owner who asks the sake maker to a uh, person who makes sake, I mean, to do what to do actually. Then that person who is in charge of the sake making is called master brewer Toji. So Kura, Kuramoto, and the Toji is often now used in a, you know English. So it would be quite useful to remember. Then yes. I'm finished. <laughs> You're not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can drink now. <laughs> uh, so, Sunny will tell you uh, how to drink and also what kind of vessels we can use to enjoy sake, okay? So, uh, before we go going to drink, I will go for a little bit about the, uh, the sake, um, sake wear. So, the wine grass is absolutely fine for uh, especially the fruitier sake like gijo, daiginjo type of sake are very good with the wine grass. Or we have a very special grass from Lido called Junmai grass, or they also have a daiginjo grass looks like this one. So if you wanna go fancy, you can go like this kind of fancy grasses, or if you wanna go really, Fanatical about sake. We have a this beautiful sake cup. So many. This is pretty. Typical. Yes, a typical one like this pretty grass. So you can actually collect those type of uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful. So we call ochako. Yeah, it's really small uh, cup. So this is perfect when we are doing the party in Japan with Japanese people because they normally don't pour sake by yourself. So the, the normally the boss will come to you and then, uh, uh, oh yeah, would you like to have a gra uh, sake from me? So you must receive with empty cups. So you have to finish it. <laughs> if you have this big cup, 
it would be very difficult to finish and you will, by the time you get receiving like five, six bosses, you'd be finished. So <laughs> this is the perfect way to, uh, <laughs> to taste sake. And also the, uh, the Junmai sake is actually better drinking. In my opinion, the sake has a little bit more richer, savory character, which you don't want to have a too much nose are actually suitable with smaller cups so that, um, or you might grasp from a little if you're gonna go fancy, but these are the way, way that you don't have to go at the um, unfamiliar smell, but more taste of the umami. So that's uh, the time I really like to enjoy this kind of little grass. So I personally, when I, when I use this one, big glasses and the smaller one, I kind of differentiate. If I really want to enjoy the quality of sake, then I might actually, just like a wine, use the full, you know, airy things. But if I really want to enjoy the friendship, why not use this one? Little bit for you, little bit for me. And this is more social, you know, purpose so you don't have to really worry about it if you don't have those just enjoy with your glasses you don't need to buy anything only for sake even this kind of like a water glass is fine. Just masculine <laughs> really fine yeah this is actually sake not water oh really no way no. <laughs> <laughs> you got really... one cup right <laughs> I was wondering I, this whole time. I was just like, is that uh, I knew it in the morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so shall we talk about the first sake? The Soma has this sake from uh, Koshino Kanbai. It's the other uh, name of the brewery. And then uh, uh, co uh, the sake is called Toksen. Toksen means uh, uh, special select. So uh, from uh, Niigata Prefecture, this is the uh, uh, Niigata is very famous for dry, crisp, and uh, clean type of sake. So it's the, one of the uh, famous uh, rice growing area as well as the uh, sake brewing area. And this special select sake was the pioneer of the Niigata sake. At the time of Japan in the uh, uh, early 70s and 80s, we had a quite sweet sake, not, not necessarily uh, dessert sake, but it was a lot heavier, richer, uh, more umami focused uh, sake. Then this uh, Koshino Kanbai was like too heavy. We have a lot of sashimi around this area. We want to have something much more clean and crisp. So they searched for uh, good sake rice for everywhere in Japan. And then they're using the rice variety called Yamada Nishiki from Hyogo Prefecture. And then they wanted to make something lighter sake, so, and drier, cleaner. So it would be suitable with their food. That's why they call it special select. And uh, uh, the smell, uh, do you have sake here? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so the, the smell is very, um, what would you say the other, when you have a very high quality rice and you cook the rice, smells like this beautiful white rice. Not the brown rice, not the second day rice. It just has the green, clear uh, aroma. It doesn't have that much fruity aroma. That's not what they want to do. They want to have very straightforward. So straightforward, more pure, clean rice uh, aroma. So. I don't know if you mean <laughs> yet. And then taste as well. Very clean, straightforward, light and crisp and dry. So it goes very, very good with the uh, um, seafood. It's easy to say, but <laughs> sashimi, sushi. Sushi is my favorite with this sake. If I may add, historically, this Koshino Kanbai from this prefecture made through a revolution. In the past, the sake was quite heavy, unsophisticated and uh, really sweet. And the people started, you know, a bit feeling too much. Then this light and crispy 
Tanbe Karakuchi is the word they start mm. using 1970s or something like that. Then the whole Japan actually changed the style this direction. So this was a breakthrough sake by Koshino Kan by this brand and light and crisp. This is a, in a way modern sake as a style. Before the sake was much masculine. This is more feminine, elegant and light. Very nice. And that, does that have no, to do with the water? Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was wondering if that had something to do with the water as well, um, which made it such a clean, light style. Yeah, water does something. I mean, Niigata has, uh, uh, as you can see, the prefecture is quite long. So they have a different type of water. And that area is actually uh, medium soft. It's not extremely soft. And they, at the time of the Japan in 1970s, they wanted to make sake so sweet by using more koji. So the, right. the you know, the more rice and, and the, the turning in sugar. So it's like a really um, rich and sweet yeah. because we... Um, full body. Yeah, yeah full body type of sake. Because, you know, the after World War II, we didn't have enough rice and we didn't have enough, enough nutrition. So we wanted to have a more calorie coming from sake as well. And the sweet will... Uh, ease the hunger as well. So, mm. you, know, you get the more calories, right? So that time, so the 50s and 60s, we needed that. But 70s, when we become so rich, we didn't need to have this sweet and heavy. We wanted, we could have more elegant and quality and drier sake. So the Koshino Kanbai was the one that, you know, we should make something that uh, not only feeding the, you know, hunger, just yeah, to have the yeah. and dry and clean sake. So yeah, they're the other one, they're, they're starting point. So yeah, then Robin can talk about regionality, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good topic. Actually, um, I was very curious about that because, well, I don't know, it's big because I grew up in France, but I know that everyone's quite protective of their regionality in France, you know, uh, regarding wine, and it's quite a big topic. Um, and so I was wondering if this was sort of the, the, the sense of place that we have for wine. Is it applicable to sake? Um, and last year, I actually had the pleasure to meet uh, the, the president of Camoisemi Brewery, which is, I think, the next sake we're having, right? Yes. Um, yeah, and I asked him directly... Uh, this question because I was I was wondering is there such a thing as like original sake and Ria mentioned it earlier but um, wine might be made from God which <laughs> probably means nature right and so the soil and the acidity of the soil and the place and the grape and the weather uh, but sake is made is heavily made by men so while wine could be 80% ingredients 20% men sake is the, the opposite um, and so there's some sort of terroir in Psyche, in my opinion, and I'm actually very curious to, to see the take of, of Osami and Rhee on that, uh, because um, the president of that brewery told me, it was like, um, the, the terroir comes from the people and from the toji and from the brewery more than the ingredients. Uh, a lot of the ingredients can be transported throughout Japan. Um, actually, that, that, that Niigata we had, is met with Yamada Nishiki, right? Which is grown in another region, um, not in Niigata. So the, the the sense of place really does not necessarily belong in the ingredients, but more in the people making it. In it's the more of the style that's been made. So each region yes. has a typical style rather than the actual grains themselves would impart the flavor. Absolutely. And that style comes from the local food. So the sake is made to match the local food. We belong to that local place. Like uh, as Sammy said, you know, they wanted uh, to match uh, seafood so they created a uh, clearer sake. Uh, if you go in land with more uh, meat, perhaps, then you will have like a fuller sake. Um, but so it's a very, uh, it's a very, it's, it's still very uh, a topic that grows, that that's growing and developing in Japan. 
Uh, I know that Yamanaga Prefecture, Yamagata Prefecture, which is actually close to Niigata, um, was one of the first prefecture to get a GI, a geographical indication, um, just like Champagne, um, which means that um, it has to follow a certain uh, brewing process and it has to come from local ingredients only. So it's a quite a new concept, I think, in sake, uh, but it belongs rather in the people and in the way to do it rather than the ingredients. Um, so it's, it's not like a black or white answer, but I think uh, the human factor definitely has to be considered more heavily uh, than when we talk about wine. And then also, normally the south part of Japan, like well, west part of Japan, they have a sweeter taste. Yes. Even soy sauce is sweeter. And north part of Japan has kind of a drier taste. So this even soy sauce is drier, not, not dry, like more salty. So the, a lot of salty food in the north part of Japan and south part of Japan has sweeter. So sake becomes similar to the, with catered to their tastes, right? And, and you can see Japan is a very long country uh, geographically across many different longitudes. And so the weather varies drastically from the south to the north. And so the food is very different and what they can grow in terms of rice and the type of water is very different across the country. Uh, so that the, the local locality yeah, comes into play in that regard as well. Do they purify the water or do they just use the water they have and the water varies depending on where they are? They don't really purify, but the, the, the water is very pure. It's, one is from the underground river and, uh, you know, it, it's really, it has a lot of character, but it's, they're already drinkably pure. Because I was told by a Japanese friend who lives in London, she makes all of her soups, like her Japanese soups and everything, using Scottish Highland water because that's actually closer to Japanese or like she's just like English water, like whatever doesn't like cut it, I have to use to make my soup. I don't know what you thought about that. Yeah, I agree. And when I uh, mix uh, sake with water, I use the Highland water from Scotland. Actually, ah! the yeah. closest water you can get, especially when you make a Japanese tea, the one is called a Borvik. Oh! That's the one. Uh, every body recommends mm -hmm. to buy it uh, because it's the softest water you can find. Interesting, okay. Shall we go next one? Oh, next one. So the, uh, the next one is the uh, Tedorigawa Kinka. Tedorigawa is located in uh, Ishikawa Prefecture. Uh, you, can you see the orangey one? It's the, uh, the uh, little peninsula by the, uh, the west coast of Japan. And uh, that area is the area of the uh, Japan Sea. So my image of Japan Sea is like <laughs> so the, uh, the my image of Japan Sea is like really rough uh, ocean, uh, cold wind, and dark winter time. Masculine, masculine. Yes. Yeah. So that's the perfect temperature for making sake because it's really cold and brutal. Nobody wants to go outside. And then <laughs> they just uh, have uh, the perfect temperature for making sake. That area has actually a little bit harder water. So as I said, the very sprushing water that creates the mineral into the um, soil. That uh, water is traveling under the ground it would collect more uh, minerals. So compared to UK, it's like a 10 times less uh, <laughs> minerals, but then uh, uh, for considering in, within Japan, there is a little bit more mineral in that area of Japan and this priority as well. So um, it has that kind of like very clean, dry bone structure compared to the uh, uh, Koshinokanba, the first sake. Koshinokanba is a lot soft, even though it's dry and clean, uh, dry and crisp. This one is a little bit more um, like a tighter. When you drink harder water, it has the feeling of the dryness. Oh. Oh, is can, I just, um, can I just add, if you, if you ordered the mini bottles, 
the the one that's similar to this one is the I can't pronounce the, the this one Yamaha the Ginjo. Uh, same company. I mean the blue one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is that one? That's or, the one. Or as I've got written down, the chrysanthemum meadow. Yeah. Oh, I should have put the English name too. So the, <laughs> So sorry, the, uh, um, somebody already lucky person really bought the other uh, this Yamaha Dai Ginjo. We are actually sold out. Uh, it, it's so popular. Uh, we were we won't have any more stock. I'm so sorry. So we had to do a little bit alternative. But the other uh, coming from same producer and it's Dai Ginjo. This. Um, Tedorigawa Yamaha, Yamaha means old method of making sake. So the uh, the one part they are making is a little bit more natural or wild. So that makes sake a little bit more complex and um, it's suitable for the harder water uh, sake making. So <laughs> yeah, that makes uh, sake has a little slight acidity like yogurt, uh, quite creamy texture and uh, so mm. this sake particular is not too much but when you smell it it has that beautiful uh, like uh, lactic note and this one the kinka is actually unpasteurized so Lee san told you that uh, we don't add it any sulfite or preservatives what we do is pasteurization put sake in the hot water so around 60 degrees the sake will be stabilized and the uh, enzyme is uh, deactivated and uh, some bacteria will be dead <laughs> in a 60 degree uh, however, this one it didn't. So the other uh, enzyme is still active, and also the, um, the some bacteria might be living, but it's really all good, good bacteria. Good, good bacteria. <laughs> so the aroma is a lot more pronounced compared to the first one, and a little bit more. Um, to me, it has the kind of salted caramel, uh, pear, little bit of. Uh, um, like a apple that is cooked, but cooked and cold, not the cooking and warm. No. Um, someone asked earlier about um, this. You've been very judicious in, in talking about the, the uh, polishing ratio and alcohol percentage and acidity. Um, how does acidity, someone asked, translate into pH level? That I still haven't figured out. I was like, I. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know because the, yeah, the compared to wine, the sake has a lot less acidity. They give um, really yeah. low in acidity. So it's more similar to sherry, I think. But it's a, acidity is a different type of acidity mm. because in wine we have a tartaric acid and also citric acidic. But that is something we don't have it. That gives a freshness, like uh, you know. Uh, stimulating the side of the mouth or something. But we have a, another acidity, I mean, the amino acid, that's a completely mm -hmm. different one, which gives more, you know, flavor. And um, that makes the sake very unique. But um, pH, I think it was, oh no, that's acidity, I'm sorry. I just can't tell, yeah. remember. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the acidity I'm putting on here, uh, 1.0 is kind of uh, normal. And if you see it, 2.0 is really high. Yeah. You know, so 1.7, like the other, uh, uh, this one is 1.1 and sorry. The, this, uh, the Kamui Zimishu saying is 1.7, we'd be like, oh, it's quite a high in acidity type of sake. So, uh, but uh, compared to wine, wine probably would be five or no, ten. Wine is like a 2.9 to 3.9 or something but like the that. The measure is a bit different. Right. Sake acidity measurement is a little bit different. So, sorry, I will think mm -hmm. again. <laughs> so, Okay, and we will be talking about uh, polishing ratio now, right? Robin? Yeah, the second classification, it's quite of a big one. And I don't know like here who's familiar or who's not with 
that sort of topic in general. So if you can just live in on the chat, I'd appreciate it. And so I will not bore you to death with percentages <laughs> and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but I think what's good to know though, is that, uh, so the sake uh, that everyone's drinking is considered and is classified as premium sake. And that represents only about 30% of the total sake markets. Uh, so actually the majority of sake out there, especially in Japan, not so much abroad, um, is what they call futsuchu, which means regular table sake. Uh, but here we'll be talking about uh, the classification of premium sake, which is generally the only sake that you'll ever encounter, I, I think, outside of Japan, really. Um, so if Asami can go to the next slide. And then, so yeah, that's, that's an instant slide. Um, so there are two families of sake. Um, sake, we are called pure rice or junmai. And these are made with only rice, water, koji, that magical fungus that we have mentioned that converts the rice starch into sugar and yeast, which makes the fermentation. And non-junmai sake, which are made with the same ingredient, except on this case, there's a bit of distilled alcohol in it. And I should mention it now that that distilled alcohol put in is not to fortify it like port or something like that. It's not to make it stronger um, it's, or to increase the yield. It's just to sort of putting everything together. Like when you cook with wine, uh, sometimes you put a bit of wine to like make a sauce and you want to keep everything up together. Uh, that distilled alcohol has the same effect. It's just to control the flavor and bring out some aromas from the brewer. Um, and so those are the two families, the Jinmai, which is pure, and the non-Jinmai, which has a bit of distilled alcohol in it. And so within those two families, then, uh, they're categorized, subcategorized according to the polishing ratio. And polishing ratio, uh, so for example, let's start at the bottom. When I say at least, so a 70% polishing ratio means that 30% of the rice has been milled away and only 70% of the original size of the rice is left. And so the smaller the number, well, the smaller the rice grain. And so the more rice is needed and hence the more premium, more delicate, and the more expensive it becomes <laughs> because to make one liter of the same product, you need 50% more rice or so. Uh, so at the bottom here, you have Junmai and Onjozo, which are rice that are not so polished. And then as you go up, uh, then you have Junmai Ginjo and their Ginjo, and Junmai Dai Ginjo and Dai Ginjo, and those are terms for uh, premium sakes. Um, the, the higher you go, the more floral and delicate it will become. And so what we've drunk so far were Ginjos and Dai Ginjos, if I'm correct. So those are the two top parts. And so this is why they're more floral, more fruity. Uh, compared to what's coming next, which is a Jinmai, uh, which is less polished, a bit more full-bodied, uh, and they're the one that are more appropriate as well to have warm, actually. Um, so yeah, people might have a lot of question about this. It's a very, it's a very not really interesting topic, but it's necessary to know because sake is quite well priced, and so. It's important to know that, to know why you're paying more for a Jinmai Daginjo that you're paying for an Honjozo, for example. And why is it cheaper? Well, it's because it's made differently with different amount of ingredients and all that. And so polishing is just one aspect, obviously. The less polished the rice, the more complicated it becomes to brew the sake and so on and so forth. So I think it's just a good thing to have in mind, but let's not be obsessed about it, you know, like... At the end of the day, it's what you like, right? <laughs> so the, okay. the, the polishing ratio will also influence the style. So if you find that you like the Ginjo style, you can keep buying Ginjo and it will be of a similar yeah. range. Absolutely, yeah. Ginjo is quite a... It's quite a if, if you don't know, I think like what people say is that if you don't know about sake, just go with Ginjo because it's quite well polished, it's floral, it's easy to drink. Like you can't really go wrong, you know, with a Ginjo. So, um, and that means that you probably like lighter, fruitier, floral sake compared to other types. So yeah, that's, that's that would be a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it's not as expensive as like Ginjo, so. Right. <laughs> but I still love, uh, Jumai sake. So, yeah. so, as Robin said, the Jumai is uh, uh, not as polished as the uh, Dai Ginjo or the uh, Ginjo sake. So, therefore, the sake becomes a lot richer, fuller, and more savory. 
and this particular sake is uh, aged for one year and a half. And uh, as you can see, there is a little bit of color, darker color compared to the other uh, sake that I have here. Well, this one has a wow. color too. So that color is coming from the aging, like almost like caramelizing the um, sake. And then you smell this uh, mushroom, um, savory forest and uh, uh, wet leaves and those kind of aroma is found in this uh, sake. And with drinking my sake grass, it's mm. a lot nicer. <laughs> well, did, we do we this, did we have the sake at the event we did together with the teriyaki course? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. From, from reverse, yeah. So the uh, definitely the teriyaki and daiginjo, I don't think it would go quite nicely because the teriyaki has a very sweet soy sauce and quite rich. And then you're having a really light and easy daiginjo, maybe it disappears or maybe becoming a little alcoholic. This one has a little bit of sweetness, rich character. So uh, it's definitely is a perfect sake for teriyaki or warming. So we made it. Yeah. Warm. You warmed it up. That's what you yes. did. That's when you warmed it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is how we serve, first of all. Yeah. We normally use both hands for everything in Japan. <laughs> Yeah. Then we always serve uh, back. You don't pour by yourself. Thank you. I have a big cup. Come by. Let come by again. <laughs> mm. Super delicious. Delicious. When, mm. when you have a rich sake, then uh, uh, warming up is perfect. So. If you are drinking and comparing with the Daiginjo or even the one before, Koshino Kanbai especially, you played with a different style. This is much more uh, almost a country side. <laughs> Unsophisticated is not the, it sounds good, but uh, you know, you know that the everyday kind of relaxed casual sake. Yeah, but it's big. Mm. As I say, the, uh, this uh, brewery, uh, well, west part of sake are a little bit sweeter. And as you can see, the Hiroshima is located in the west part of Japan. And they are uh, famous for uh, okonomiyaki, the, uh, the Japanese pancake with a lot of sweet soy sauce and things like that. So they're trying to make sake suitable to their uh, local cuisine and this mm. is the perfect one for that kind of uh, sweet. Talking sweet about things. the uh, food pairing, Asami and Anna, I, I cook today <laughs> that was but it's um, made a lamb chop, you know, <sighs> beautiful. That's why we that had it is, with this. So it's delicious. Oh, lovely. Really mm. nice. It's a very meaty sake actually. Yes. And I uh, also uh, have to mention the Masumi Okuden. Uh, some of you have this sake on your hands are similar uh, or same category. The Masumi Okuden has a lot lighter, easier character, but still has the uh, um, kind of creamy, uh, rich character as well. So, and they're coming from Nagano Prefecture. You see the uh, middle part of Japan, there's no ocean side. So uh, food pairing will be more, not with the fish, more with the other uh, uh, mountain vegetables, the game and those kind of things are very good. And you can also warm up quite nicely. So the, some of you are super lucky to have this sake so that you should enjoy it. Thank you for buying. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry that we don't have it in the warehouse. So I can taste it another month or so. so. The Robin will be talking about um, temperature. Yeah, talking about hot sake, I received as a gift the coolest thing to warm up your sake at home without using the kitchen, which is always nice. Um, Check this out. It has a candle at the bottom of it. No. And it boils the well boils. It warms the, the water in the uh, bowl. And then it heats up the sake that I've put in the tokuri, which is the dispenser. Yes, so 
Thank you. How cool is this? I just literally had it as a gift, uh, and that was quite timely for this uh, webinar. So really when they say you should gently warm it, is that the way to do it? Yeah, exactly. So then you can actually, I uh, wish if I had a thermometer, you would like put it in and you could like pull which temperature you want it at. And then you just, I probably have to blow on the kettle. Sorry, guys. <sighs> because otherwise I might boil it. <laughs> it's been on <laughs> since we started the webinar and I wanted to stop it at some point. I was getting worried. Um, yeah, so uh, cold and uh, warm sake. Um, well, I always thought that sake was drunk warm. That's the thing, the classic image that people have uh, about sake and when I first had sake in Japan it was served in a wine glass and it blew my mind I was like what is this all I thought you know was a lie it was just you know it was just a bit mental uh, but traditionally sake has been drank warm and there's a lot of good reasons for that um, well first of all it's, it's nice and comforting in winter uh, in a cold, harsh Japanese winter is the best thing you can probably do in Niigata actually if you're in Niigata which is uh, if you go skiing and then you go après ski, Japanese style, you have warm sake is the best thing in the life in your life. Uh, but it also makes the sake feel rounder on the palate and on the tongue, and it increases the umami level. So for a junmai sake, like the one uh, that uh, we have now, um, is good for that because it makes it really round, really umami driven, uh, very gentle. Um, and it also, I've, so I, I, I kind of want, uh, Asami mean, and yes, take on that, but I've I've read that apparently having warm sake uh, is better for the body because it doesn't need to fight to warm it down to body temperature and it digests it and process it more easily. Is that like a real medical thing or? <laughs> yes, definitely. So because it's similar to your body temperature, so it's really easy to right. go into your vein. And you get drunk so quickly, <laughs> but then disappears so quickly too. Oh, so okay. Better for the next day, actually. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and also the broad circulation is really excellent with the warm sake. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and on the other side, you know, you have, uh, so those were more traditional sake, right? That's when rice polishing method and machines, you know, were not fully developed. So obviously you had fuller sake naturally. But uh, recently with the advance of technology, now we can polish rice like to the 1% if we want to. And so more delicate and floral sake came about and those sake are better enjoyed like white wine. So like the Niigata, uh, the first one we had where you want to have it a bit chill in a wine glass to feel the fresh aromas, you know, and also increase that crispiness, which is quite nice. And, um, and it's also the sort of food you're going to have it with. Uh, so with sashimi and sushi, it goes like a really nice. Uh, um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, it depends on what you have, really. And also what's cool is that uh, you can have one cold sake. So actually this one now. So I've had it cold when I first started. And then it sort of warmed down to room temperature as we spoke. <laughs> and I've been keeping putting myself glasses. I don't care because it's after 7 p.m. Uh, and it tasted very sort of like, you know, the texture and the aromas and the flavor is very different as I drank it. And so it's, it's a really cool experience to do uh, with any sake, really. Um, have it at the original temperature, warm or chill, and then let it cool down or warm up a little bit. And then you'll, have to, you'll get to experience something different from the same bottle, which is more value even, so even it's like almost this. three psyches in one really uh and it's something that um is very important sometimes i i, I tend to live the i don't know some daiginjo because i have drinking coal like in the fridge for too long and i realized like it, it's a bit too crisp and almost dead on the nose as i take it out of the fridge and i just something lighter and then you move you know then you can just let it warm up naturally or with a sake you can just heat it up gradually and just you can enjoy it throughout the meal and appreciate the different nuances um or you have a tapas style meal and actually you know just see what goes I mean, I, like that's how i have fun anyway playing with my um food and wine and uh yeah and just like seeing how it evolves and how it complements different um yeah, different fruits, different flavors, different temperatures, whether something's fried, whether something's in like a kind of rich teriyaki sauce or yeah, I, um, it's really fun to experiment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. 
Also, um, depending on the mood, depending on the season, and uh, you know, there's no rule for sake. Sake is something you really you enjoy without, you know, being so rigid. It's, um, that's another beautiful thing about sake. Can I um, follow you up on? Because someone asked earlier, and I was going to flag it up anyway. Because there's no rules with sake, and because it's really to do with craftsmanship as opposed to ingredients, is there an argument for saying, do you have to make sake in Japan? Uh, for example, on sake, National Sake Day uh, on the 1st of October, I enjoyed a lovely sake made by the first female uh, master sake brewer. Uh, and she, they actually have a sake brewery based in Southern California. Um, now I'm actually drinking something which is made in Japan, but it's a collaboration. It's Heaven Sake, and it's a it's a really cool bottle, um, and it's a Junmai Daiginjo, so it is expensive. It is about ninety nine dollars, but um, it's a collaboration between an award winning champagne maker from France, uh, Regis Camus, um, and he brews this sake at Dasai Brewery, one of the most famous yeah, breweries which have been around for 200 years. So, I, and also the year I left England to go spend more time in the States, Dojima Brewery had just been set up in Cambridge and they seem to be doing very well. So I was just curious on your take of collaborations of breweries themselves being based in other countries and how that's being received. Yeah, that's uh, exactly something happening. Actually, Heaven Sake is something I helped out to start with. Uh, when I met them about seven, eight years ago in mm. Paris, they wanted to actually start making it in France, but um, eventually, um, you know, it was a good idea to collaborate. Um, that's our, and Rakasumi, now Konishi, they are, you know, with the three partnership and making sake. So one is like that, and also making, you know, Japanese sake makers are making here, and also in France about four sake brewers are making, so it is becoming really diversity, you know, and the, the more developed, the less rigid rules we have, and the sake is something Anyway, almost too complicated to be free. <laughs> so there's no such a one rule because everybody breaks it. But there's one solid rule is like a premium sake. There's just very strict rules how it should be made, how much percentage or how, what's the ingredients. These are the very rules for making, but there's no really rules for us to drink it. So, you know, it's quite interesting and diversity, but there's always a saying, you must learn the rules before you break it. So once you know the, you know, main things, then you just, you really relax and uh, enjoy it. Such as which sake to drink hot, which sake should be drunk cold. Before we were saying hot sake is usually table sake or junmai sake, which is not the top, top sake. And the cold sake, I mean the top sake, like a daiginjo should be drunk cold. That was a quite, you know, regulation, not regulation, everybody. Yeah. But now people are just completely experimenting everything. So the more we talked about it, the more we feel, you know, <laughs> lost what to do, actually. Yeah. But I think the quality of the sake made in overseas is um, getting better. Like US making a lot of sake, and then I think it's uh, pretty good. I mean, I love it. It's been um, even on regular delivery drinks, delivery apps and services. But actually, a surprising range of sake available. It's, yeah. it's very widely accepted and enjoyed. It seems. Yeah. 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 I mean, for like judging level of the like really top end level, I think still the Japan is the best. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, I tasted. I mean, I tasted. Uh, 
several um quite few overseas sakes but uh like dojima sake was quite really com very good for non-japanese um really but compared to the top japanese sake it's to me it was just Average, you know what I mean. So the <laughs> it's okay. It's a really beautiful sake, considering they're using the water from the UK. And then so the behind the story is incredibly um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Sometimes everybody has a different taste. It doesn't have to be really expensive one to make you happy. <laughs> so, and also the rice has to transfer. Uh, from Japan because they really don't have the uh, rice polishing machine. So they can get rice very easily, but the brown rice cannot be polished to 50% polishing ratio, 35% polishing ratio. So that means you really have to buy the Daiginjo level rice from uh, Japan or something like that. That makes the rice a little bit oxidized. So the the level of things that you can get outside of Japan is still not there yet. Do you so, know, this is exactly the same like a wine world. It's a you know, old world, new world. Still people, I love French wine like a burgundy still. In the end of the day, if I had money, I would like to drink like that. <laughs> um, likewise, one day, sooner or later, sake will be made all over the world. And the new world, you know, England will be making, they will be even producing the rice. So, you know, they don't need to import. Spain started doing that. They started oh. cultivating rice and they are making, yeah, um, uh, Antonio Campos. They are making sake and they are even trying to cultivate the most important rice variety called the Yamada Nishiki Sum. So right. one day, you just have to choose the new world or Japan. And the Japan should stay as a really most desirable sake. Uh, that's what I'm really hoping. Everybody has a different needs. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I love it overseas to make a sake. And I really hope everybody should be affordably drinking. Mm. The sadness about the sake in England, for example, it's too expensive. When I say too expensive it is, in Japan, it's say 10 pounds. <laughs> when it comes to London, it becomes like a 40, 50 pounds. This gap is, to me, a bit sad. <laughs> So it, you really need to, to be lower the price. Yeah, for the, everybody to drink delicious mm. sake. Um, can I also just um, ask a question and confess something at the same time? Um, I think lots of people, and I did this, um, can think that like wine, sake can age. So I got given, for example, this really <laughs> lovely <laughs> in my Ginjo Yanagi sake. Ah, from Kyoto, yeah. And I took it with me, I had it, I saved it for at least two years, I took it with me in my wine suitcase in LA, and I tried it, and it had died, and like, I'm now thinking maybe I can have really expensive moisturizer. May I say one thing beforehand? We are coming back to the temperature. Um, sake, by warming it, this kind of disguise the faultiness. So if you think sake is a little bit oxidized off, then when you warm it, you don't feel it, you don't notice. That's another way to warm it up. But Amelia, uh, you kept it like five years. <laughs> the, that's a bad girl. But then Some, once we open a bottle, how long can it remain open? in my fridge. Well, this is something I wanted to tell you a bit later about the difference uh, between sorry. wine and the sake. But uh, sake doesn't evolve. Sake is not like a wine. These are made to drink, you know, when you see it, that's a time to drink. Because sake maker, Kura, 
we do not going to release sake unless it is time to drink. That's the biggest difference. In one word, we have Omploma. You sell it as a baby so that you keep it to make it mature. Sake, they, sake maker keep it to get ready for, you know, to go out. So you don't really need to worry about the storing. It's a time to drink when you see it. Sake, what is the longevity? It really depends on where you keep it. But we say, if you see it within a year or so, it's advisable to drink. But if you keep it in the cold refrigerator, it can actually live, but it's not like a wine. It doesn't evolve. It doesn't really get better. It doesn't change quickly, but uh, you know, some wine, I wait 20 years to get better, <laughs> but sake, no way. Yeah. But once opened, uh, depending on the sake, if the sake is quite fruity or daiginjo, I recommend drinking within 10 days. Okay. But, yeah, uh, but if you have a sake like this one, the umami rich sake, more uh, savory ones, after one month, it's still delicious. Yeah. So you can just keep it really long time. I don't know if it, it will last one month. That's the question. <laughs> you might get it all. Uh -huh. but, uh, and most of sake has the other uh, uh, date on the label. So this means the uh, um, this sake left the brewery on this day. So this one is 2020 January, this sake left uh, Japan. It's a little bit longer time for us as a uh, distributor because we had a COVID problem. So that's, uh, uh, anyway, from this date, uh, about a year and a half to two years is the, the it's not expiry, expiry date, but recommended date to just drink. So if it's older than this, then two years, then you should not buy it even. <laughs> Which sort of ties to the price of sake in London, right? Like the, the transportation method, you know, like the sake that a semi is holding is unpasteurized, has to be shipped, refrigerated. You can't keep it for long. So it, it, it adds to the transportation cost and to the price. And also I think it, it costs, I was quite surprised when I learned that. I thought it was going to be the opposite, but as raw ingredients, like rice is much more expensive than grapes to make wine. And I was, I, th I thought it was not going to be this way, but like, yeah, so it, th there's a lot of confidence that goes into it, actually. Um, I know in France, you can find a good bowl of wine for like a good bowl for like four euros and it will be decent wine. But in Japan, like even a regular sake will go for 1200 yen, which is about eight, nine euros. So there's a bit of a ingredient base as well, like sort of, you know, um, cost. Yeah. So we actually need more people in the, in say Europe to get the equipment, to learn how to make sake and to grow the rice. Um, I think Jane mentioned Italy has, has, uh, rice growing area in the Po Valley. Are, are there any breweries there? So if we, you know, if we do that, then we might be able to get some less expensive sake. Yeah. And then people will be able to trade up as they learn more, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And there's like this craft brewery in London, right? For me, it's the biggest mystery is that why not the big sake makers in Japan try to sell table sake cheaper? for that, you know, all the public can afford. But uh, I, unfortunately, I think of, um, should you go back to yeah, but it's not the big, you know, it's very difficult to buy sake in this country, this not one. If you go to the supermarket, you know, there are not many decent sake when I say mm. it's there. It's everything is made in America. It doesn't mean that it's bad, but there are some sakes which are really, uh, too, in my taste, it's like a factory I'm not made. really ac yeah. accepting. Mm. Mm. So it, it shall takes we talk about shall we talk? Yeah, shall we, we, shall we talk? <laughs> yeah, let's move otherwise, on. It's a time to... Yeah, otherwise we're going to be... Yeah. <laughs> I'm so in a happy thing here drinking, but... Yeah, next sake is Nigori. Uh, 
Uh, nigori in Japanese means cloudy. It's not unfiltered. It's actually filtered because the uh, uh, every second it must be filtered uh, by row. So we filter it with the uh, the uh, quite large uh, mesh the, or the filtration so that all the rice grain rice will be stay kept in the bottle, and then uh, uh, we actually mix it uh, with the uh, rice mush. So some people say, oh, is it milk <laughs> or is it like some, some, some creamy things in there? But no, this is actually the original color of the sake because rice is white and having a clear color, we only filter the top part, taking the top part and then the bottom part is used for cosmetics or food or something like that. Anyway, so the, uh, this one is the cloudy sake from Kamoizumi uh, again. <sighs> Nice color. Nice color, really nice. It's like so, a milk. Yeah. So this is the rice particle uh, that you're getting. And uh, and when you swell, you get this kind of oily, uh, oily thing, oily things in the grass, the legs are actually the rice oil. So some people be like, ew, that's kind of like really strange. But actually, if you think it's rice oil, sounds so nice. <laughs> but it is <laughs> very nice. So uh, this is actually unpasteurized and um, diluted with water. That's why the alcohol percentage is 18%. It's a little bit higher. Wow, high. Yes, it's quite high. But it smells a little bit more. It has Every time I smell this one, I smell the daikon radish. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> some people say like a common bell cheese when it's very like white, uh, the white mold kind of smells or uh, to me, the pineapple core, mm. that's the kind of like fresh aroma is in here. I think we have this with like the stronger sushi. You know how you can get some like more delicate sushi and stronger sushi. I think when we did our event, we had this one with with the, the kind of uni and the kind of stronger flavored sushi. Mm, yeah, well, I never <laughs> tried with sushi yet, but no? yeah, definitely. So I tried it with the uh, um, salmon roll. That was actually quite nice. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. And also to me, this is more about duck or meat, lamb chop is delicious. Chinese food is really good uh, with uh, uh, more beef or stronger meat type of things are uh, quite beautiful. And uh, uh, if you're having these bottles, you might be surprised. This is exactly the same sake. So this one is pasteurized and filtered and aged for a year and a half at room temperature. This one is just made and bottled and lovely filtered. So the taste is completely different, but when you actually taste it, and if you know it, it has a little bit of a similarity. You get the mushroomy kind of character mm. a bit. Very rusty. Yeah, yeah. very rusty. <laughs> but it's quite mm, unique, quite fun comparison of this one. This kind of sake is like, uh, you know, either you like it or love it or hate it. Uh, also kind of a acquired taste. Yeah. We call it like snow. So when I having a, a food pairing and then I cannot pair anything like even cheese. And if I bring this one, some, it works like beautifully. When it works, beautiful. When it doesn't work, it's a disaster. But when it does, it just brings up the food uh, incredibly delicious. So um, also, <clears throat> because this one is um, diluted with water, you can dilute with water. So if you have water, you can oh, add it. Yeah. On or the rock. ice cube. Yeah, ice, ice cube, hot water. You can do pretty much do anything, actually. 18% so. is a really high for even for sake. And uh, under the regulation, again, uh, sake is has, has to be below 21 uh, percentage. 
and it's impossible to ferment up to that level. So in a way, you can relax. No sake would be more than <laughs> 19. If you see it, 19, this is really special. But so, I remember in the beginning, Jenny, Jenny the, said the other who was drinking Red Label, Tamagawa Red Label. Do you remember, Robin? Say that again? In the beginning of the this show, the uh, one of the guests was drinking. Oh my God, well, that's John. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah John. Um, that is twenty percent. Yeah, it's brewed by an <laughs> Englishman, right? <laughs> yeah, proper Englishman sake. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Very low, it. low, low intervention. Just like a sake naturally has the highest alcohol contents as a for a fermented beverage in the world. So naturally, if you don't do anything, it'll go up to like 20 or so percent, right? He tried um, it. Um, and so the, actually people after that put some water, well, the people, the brewers usually do add some water to make the sake more drinkable, highlight flavors and aromas and so on. Uh, yeah, that one, that red level rich that John has is great warm. Yeah, crazy one, but it's really good one. Yeah, I love it. It shouldn't be really warmed up, really. No, not it's really, nice. but you can add a tiny bit of hot water if you really? want to in the winter time. If when I do it, so Sammy, if you yes. go back to the last slide, what was hmm. the meter value? What does that mean? Yeah, the forget it. Okay. <laughs> The measurement of dryness and sweetness normally. So if it says plus, means the sake is drier. So if it's plus 12, that's like extremely dry sake. And if it says minus and the number goes higher, the sweeter it is. So if the sake is very dense, we put minus. If the sake is very light, like alcohol is light, then we put plus. So that's, that's it. So <laughs> again, sake tend to use the uh, sort of special terminology among the sake makers, which is almost like this. It doesn't communicate with a, a consumer, especially people who live overseas, with, unless you know what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it should be really replaced by sugar level, glucose, or something is more you know, approachable. This is something really sake makers need to be working to, to be more communicable. Um, so around zero or one is always something medium. It's, medium. it's not too sweet. It is not too dry. Great. Thank you. Sake variety is going to be loving. Yeah, and with that, there's a question. So sake variety, there's a question from Jamie. Right. Uh, we're saying, what's your opinion on tokubetsu sake? So tokubetsu sake, tokubetsu means special. And so it's like a special sake that's supposed to be categorized as a junmai, but because they might have used a different milling ratio or something special to it, they label it special. And, it, and he's asking, is it considered as a marketing approach or is there something real to it? I've had some that were generally different. So they were like polished as a ginjo, but they were labeled as a Tokubetsu Junmai because maybe the flavor wise, like it was more towards a Junmai than a ginjo, but that's very, uh, but yeah, that, that's a very good question. I think it's, I, I suppose because those rules are so rigid that as soon as they do something that like sort of falls out of it, they have to like label it something, but it might not be worth labeling it a ginjo so they're like okay special junmai you know or something like that so it's a bit of a yeah it's quite a weird one i'm not fully aware or sure about the exact yeah analogy. nobody the tokubetsu is a little bit more expensive right so the polishing ratio is higher so the uh, they polish more than junmai sake but then it still has a junmai character but then the price is a little bit higher than Jumai because they put a little bit more premium side, I guess. Tokubetsu means something special. So even in wine or whiskey, it's something a little, you know, when you want to make it a little bit more special, you use it. So it's like a, a little special bit of style. plus. You don't know what it means, but it's something a bit better than <laughs> it, it says. So like winemaker's reserve or special reserve. Exactly. Right. exactly. 
you can just have a shiny new label for it and they need a product to stick it on they go bam <laughs> that, that one uh second like already well i think like the 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 shoe scent so the 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 warm that we enjoy warm uh well at least that i sent me and Maria did and the cloudy one was a good example of the different variety of sake. So one sake can be many things, can be made into many different styles, I suppose we can say that. Uh, the nigari is the cloudy one where they use a uh, stronger mesh to impress, to have more residue in it, or sometimes they even, uh, usually after sake is spread, they sort of let it like decant into a tank. And sometimes they actually put the little bits at the bottom and put it back in the bottle to make it cloudy many ways to do it uh the nama sake uh with that was the second one if i recall correctly i uh, saw so yeah. the unpasteurized one so That's you... been in the last one so sake usually is pasteurized twice regular sake at least uh to kill the bacteria so like the shelf life is good and you can transport it abroad and enjoy it but sometimes they don't and so to be fair like in japan there's a lot of nama sake and pasteurized sake and it's quite nice and fresh and when i was in japan i always like wish we had more namazake here because it's, it's, it's very especially in summer it's very nice and fresh and lively but uh, transportation wise it's difficult to bring in here um and so we also have some sparkling sake which is a very interesting topic because uh there are two ways to do it some people just literally like throw co2 in the bottle and make it sparkling just like uh just like a like a pop or uh, they follow the champagne method, which is second fermentation in the bottle. Um, and so there are very different kinds of sparkling sake. There are some very sweet ones uh, and some drier, more traditional ones. And uh, that's quite new though. It's quite a new thing, I think, in the sake world. Like it's, it's, it's very recent. Uh, then you have Genshu. So Genshu uh, is a good example. So the one that John, uh, we've been talking about, drank is a Genshu sake, which is means that Fermentation happened naturally in the tank and it went all crazy high to 20%, but the brewers didn't add water to it. So it remained at 20% in the bottle too. So it's quite strong. It's actually quite nice on the rocks, I suppose, because that's the way to dilute it. Uh, hence the logo there. Um, and then we have Kichuju, which is a bit of a sweeter uh, aperitif style sake um, where they kill the fermentation early. So there's more sugar in it. And so... Um, I don't know, you can't compare it as a, as a port, but it, it's, it's on the sweeter side. So it's good for aperitif and dessert. And you, then you have aged sake, which is a very weird, different world that I feel is evolving. And so apparently, so I want to get Asami's and Ria's point on that, but apparently, so koshu is the Japanese term for aged sake, but that describe any bottle that has not pretty much been drank for three years. So you could literally, I think, <laughs> Amelia, what you have is a koshu, technically. <laughs> because yeah. you might have... Unintentional. <laughs> an accidental <laughs> one. That was not supposed to be koshu. Yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they have another term for the one that I made on purposely aged. You know, purposely aged second There's another term for it as well. Uh, so your accidental koshu, that's, that's quite unfortunate. Well, I think... I think um, Time is kind of running out, so we've yes. got to um, start wrapping up. I think this is a great slide to finish on because it gives us a good kind of an overview of the different types of styles. So thank you, Robin, for going through that. No. Mm -hmm. I think it's been amazing, like learning everything and clearly we couldn't put it in an hour and uh, we kind of got back to um, an hour and a half session. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on, I have a, what have I done now? <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we, uh, um, oh, good, okay. thank you. There we go. Um, yeah, so we, you know, we've kind of been on a massive tour and clearly some of the participants are not introductory to Saki. <laughs> yeah. We, we had a question about Maroka, it's unfiltered, but it's a Saki by law. Um, you know, it's like, I don't even know what Maroka is. Uh, so it's quite uh, quite interesting to hear um, those questions. Perhaps one of you could answer that uh, typing in so that I can just uh, wrap up with our, with our final okay. slides. Maroka. Um, so then, yeah, so 
I just wanted to say big thank you to uh, Robin, Rie and Asami for taking us through that. It's been wonderful. Amelia, for sharing your uh, aged sake. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fun. And I, you know. One awesome one though. This is, this is epic. The heaven sake is very cool. I'm, yeah. Hey, Amelia, have you opened it yet? Oh yeah, that's what I've been enjoying. <laughs> this is like the uh, one webinar where I've actually not been having the coffee. It <laughs> really wasn't water in that jug. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just, uh, yeah, I think it's just been wonderful to learn. And like I say, there's so much more to learn. Um, perhaps one day we'll do a, you know, beyond introductions to so and have a have a bit more um, depth because you know it's been it's been fascinating. Thank you everyone for attending. I won't go through um, all of I was going to go through all of the um, upcoming webinars, but if you go to either my website princessinapino.com or to Amelia's uh, Amelia'sWine.com. Is it AmeliaWine.com? Amelia's um, hyphen wine, otherwise it looks like Amelia's swine. Yeah. Oh, um, and sign up to our newsletters and you'll um, hear more about those. We've got some giveaways coming up as well with um, with some of the upcoming ones. So do sign up to be notified of that. The next one is Portugal. The wines are available. But like I say, newsletter will come out either tomorrow or Saturday um, and it will give you all of the information. So it's just best to sign up to that, not to miss it. Thank you everyone so much. And also congratulations to David uh, for last week's winner of the Avena bottle stops that we gave away there. Thank you, David. Congratulations. Um, yeah, so thank you all. Sorry it's overrun, but it's been so fascinating. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, it's been such a wonderful thank reunion. Robin, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you guys. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> See you then. Bye bye, guys. Have a good evening and day for you, Amelia. Coming, see you soon. Oh, it is going well. <laughs>